prove this? Where are we, dude? These are the circuits of history, gentlemen. They'll take us to any point in time we wish. How? Modern technology, William. Whoa. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. How dare you, sir? And Big Anklevich. And you're just screwing. Salutations. Wait, I can't say salutations because it's too lame even for me. Well, maybe. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 4, still page 21. I am Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. 08 OT. When gone am I, the last of the Jedi will you be? Announcer guy. Announcer man. Man. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Hopefully you're back for more. Today we are continuing A Place So Foreign by Cory Doctorow. Part 2 of 2. Oh, right. If you haven't listened to part one yet, then you probably have one of those iPod shuffles. I hate those. <laughs> yeah, you, sh- you should go-, go to the first part and listen to that first. That's right. If you remember from where we finished off, our hero James has just uh, decided to go back through the time travel door into the future. Out of a little rebellion, I guess, against his mother and her decision to replace his father with the guy that he dislikes a lot, Mr. James H. Johnstone. So he uh, messes around in the future, and then he tries to go back home, and he realizes it won't work any longer, and he is stuck in the future. And we pick up from there in Cory Doctorow's story, A Place So Foreign. We'd like to thank Julie Hoverson, Christine Maya Flares, and Lizanne Hurd for lending their voices to today's episode. Some sound effects were provided by the Free Sound Project. Check the links in the show notes. I'm not a stupid little kid. I didn't spend much time puling. Instead, I went to the phone and dialed the police. The screen stayed blank. Feeling like I was in a dream... I went to the teleporter and dialed for my old school and stepped in. I failed to teleport. Reality sank in. All outside services to the apartment had been shut off when we moved out. The only things that still worked were the ones that ran off our reactor, a squat armored box on the apartment's underbelly. The door in New Jerusalem worked, but on the 1975 side, it needed to communicate with the central office to approve any passage. I thought about sitting tight and waiting. Mama would be sick with worry and would check the barn eventually and see the shop bolts. She'd speak to Mr. Johnstone, who would send a telegram to Paris, and they would relay the message to 1975, and voila, I'd be rescued. I'd get the whipping of my life and do extra chores until I was 70, but it was better than starving to death after the apartment's pantry ran out. I felt hungry just thinking about it. Still, there was a better way. The Null G donut that our apartment was spoked into had a supply of escape jumpers, single-use jetpacks with a simple transponder that screamed for help on all the emergency channels. I could ride one of these down into Greater Salt Lake and wait for the police. The more I thought about this plan, the better it sounded. Better anyway than sitting around like a fairy tale princess waiting for rescue. In my mind, I was the rescuing type, not the kind that needed rescuing. Besides, there wasn't much better than riding around in one of those jetpacks. I cycled the emergency lock into the donut, unracked a pack in a jumpsuit that looked like it would fit me, and suited up. The pack whined as it powered up and ran through its diagnostics. I checked the idiot lights to make sure they were all green, feeling like a real man of action. Then I stepped into the exterior lock and jumped. Arms and legs streamlined, toes pointed. The jetpack coughed to life and kicked me gently, then started lowering me to the ground. The emergency beacon's idiot light came on, and I heaved a sigh of relief and got comfortable. The flat was peaceful and dreamlike, a slow descent over the gleaming metal city. I was so engrossed with the view 
that I didn't see the pack jackers until they were already on me. They hit me high and low. Two kids about my age with tricked out custom jetpacks with the traffic beacons broken off. One snagged my knees and hugged them to his chest while the other took me in the armpits. A voice shouted in my ear. I'm cutting your pack loose. This is a very, very sharp knife. And when I'm done, I'll be the only thing holding you up. Don't squirm. I didn't even have the chance to squirm. By the time the speech was finished, I was separated from my pack, and I spun over upside down and watched it continue its descent, straps dangling in the wind. My hair hung down, and blood filled my head, reawakening my headache. Reflexively, I twisted to get a look at my kidnappers, but stopped immediately as I felt their grips loosen. I squeezed my eyes shut and prayed. The three of us dove fast and hard, and I tasted that second helping of breakfast again before we leveled off. I risked a peek then squeezed my eyes shut again. We were speeding through the lower levels of Greater Salt Lake, the unmanned freight corridors, impossibly claustrophobic, and at our speed, dangerous. We cornered tightly so many times that I lost count, and then we slowed to a stop. They dumped me to the steel traction plate on the ground. The wind was knocked out of me, and I was barely conscious of the hands that untabbed my jumpsuit and began methodically turning out the pockets of my clothes. What the hell are you wearing, kid? One of them asked. It was the same one who'd warned me about squirming. Hearing his voice a second time, I realized that he was younger than I was. Maybe ten or eleven. Even then, it didn't occur to me to fight back. He had a knife sharp enough to cut through the safety strapping on my pack. Close. I'm from 1898. My pa's an ambassador. I don't have any money. I struggled into a sitting position and was knocked onto my back again. Stay down and he won't get hurt, the same voice said. It was young enough that I I couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl. Small hands pressed into my eyes. No peeking now. Another set of hands systematically rifled my coat and pants, then cut them loose and gave the same treatment to my underpants and shirt. I blushed as they were cut loose, too. You really don't have any money, the voice said. (laughs) I said so, didn't I? The voice said a dirty word that would have gotten me beaten black and blue back home, and then the hands were gone. I looked up just in time to see two small figures jetting away upwards. I was naked, sitting on a catwalk above a freight corridor, three quarters of a century and God knew how many miles from home. I didn't cry. I was too worried to cry. I kicked my ruined clothes down into the freight corridor and pulled on the jumpsuit. Some hero I was. It was hard work, climbing staircase after staircase up to the shopping levels. By the time I reached a level where I could see the sky, I was dripping with sweat and my headache had returned. Foot traffic was light, but what there was was pretty frightening. I'd gone walking in 75 before, of course, but Greater Salt Lake was a big place, and there were parts of it that an ambassador's son would never get to see. This was one of them. The shop fronts were all iris open airlocks and had been painted around to look like surprised mouths or eyes or, in one fascinating case, a woman's private parts. Mostly they were betting shops or bars or low rent bounce Even in 1975, the Saints still had some influence in Salt Lake and the bars and brothels were pretty shameful places where no respectable person would be caught. The other pedestrians on the street were mostly off-worlders, either spacers in uniform or XTs. In some cases, it was hard to tell which was which. I kind of slunk along, sticking to the walls, hands in my pockets. I kept my eyes down, except when I was looking around for a public phone. After several blocks, I realized that no one was paying any attention to me, and I took my hands out of my pockets. The sun filtered down over me, warm through the big dome, and I realized that even though I'd gotten myself stuck in 75, been jacked, and left in the worst neighborhood in the whole state, I'd landed on my feet. The thought made me smile. Another kid, say Ollie, wouldn't have coped nearly as well. I still hadn't spied a public phone. I figured that the tap rooms would have a phone. Otherwise, how could a drunk call his wife and tell her he was going to be late coming home? I picked a bar whose airlock was painted to look like a brick tunnel and walked in. The airlock iris shut behind me and I blinked in the gloom. My nose was assaulted with sickly sweet incense and stale liquor and cigar smoke. 
The place was tiny and crowded with dented metal tables and chairs that were bolted to floor plates. A woman stood behind the bar, looking hard and brassy and cheap, watching a soap opera on her vid. A spacer sat in one corner, staring at his bulb of beer. The bartender looked up. Get lost, kid, she said. No minors allowed. So, sorry, ma'am, I said. I just wanted to use your telephone. I was packjacked and I need to call the police. The bartender turned back to her soap opera. Go peddle it somewhere else, Sonny. The phone's for customers only. Please, I said. My father's an ambassador from 1898. I don't have any money and I'm stuck here. I won't be a minute. The spacer looked up from his drink. Get lost, the lady said. He slurred at me. I I'll buy something. You just said you don't have any money, the bartender said. I'll pay for it when the police get here. The embassy will cover it. No credit. You're not going to let me use your phone? That's right, she said, still staring at her vid. I'm a stranger, an ambassador's son who's been robbed, a kid, stuck here, broken, alone, and you won't let me use your phone to call the police? That is about the size of things. Well, I guess my pa was right. The whole world went to hell after 1914. No manners, no human decency. You're breaking my heart, she said. Fine, be that way. Send me back out onto the street. Deny me a favor that won't cost you one red cent just because I'm a stranger. Shut up, kid. For Christ's sakes, the spacer said. I'll send him to a coke if that's what it takes. Just let him use the phone and get out of here. He's giving me a headache. Thank you, sir, I said politely. The bartender switched her vid over to phone mode, poured me a Coke, and handed me the vid. The policeman who showed up a few minutes later stuck me in the back of his cruiser, listened to my story, scanned my retinas, confirmed my identity, and retracted the armor between the back and front seats. I'll take you to the station house, he said. We'll contact your embassy and let them handle it from there. What about the kids who jacked me? I asked. The cop turned the jet car's con over to wirefly mode and turned around. You got any description? Well, they had really nice packs on, with the traffic beacon snapped off. One was red, and I think the other was green. And they were young, ten or eleven. The cop punched at his screen. Kid, he said, I got over three million miners, eight to eleven, flying packs less than a year old. The most popular color is red. Second choice, green. Where would you like me to start? Alphabetically? Sorry, sir, I didn't realize. Sure, he said. Whatever. I guess I'm not thinking very clearly. It's been a long day. The cop looked over to me and smiled. I guess it has at that. Don't worry, kid. We'll get you home all right. They gave me a fresh jumpsuit, sat me on a bench, called the embassy, and forgot about me. A long, boring time later, a fat man with walrus mustaches and ruddy skin showed up. On your feet, lad, he said. I'm Pondicherry, your father's successor. You've made quite a mess of things, haven't you? He had a clipped British accent with a hint of something else. I remembered Mr. Johnstone saying he'd been in India. He wore a standard unisex jumpsuit with his ambassadorial sash over top of it. He looked ridiculous. I'm sorry to have disturbed you, sir, I said. I'm sure you are, he said. Come along, we'll see about fixing this mess. He used the station's teleporter to bring me to his apartment. It was as ridiculous as his uniform, and in the same way, he'd taken the basic elegant simplicity of a standard 1975 unit and draped all kinds of silly trophies and models over top of it, Lion's heads and sabers and model ships and framed medals and savage masks and dolls. You may look, but not touch. Do you understand me? He said as we stepped out of the teleporter. Yes, sir, I said. If anyone else had said it, I would have been offended. But coming from this puffed-up pigeon, it didn't sting much. He went to a vid and punched in patiently at the screen while I prowled the apartment. The bookcase was full of old friends. Books by the Frenchman, of course and more with strange names like Wells and Burroughs and Shelley. I looked over a long stone-headed spear and the curve of an elephant's tusk and a collection of campaign ribbons and medals under glass. 
I returned to the bookcase. Something had been bothering me. There, there it was. War of the Worlds, the book that Mr. Adelson had given me for Christmas. But there was something wrong with the spine of this one. Instead of Jules Verne, the author name was H.G. Wells. I snuck a look over my shoulder. Pondicherry was still stabbing at the screen. I snuck the book off the shelf and turned to the title page. War of the Worlds by Herbert George Wells. I turned to the first chapter. The Eve of the War. No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own, that as men busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. It was just as I remembered it, every word, just as it was in the fern. I couldn't begin to explain it. A row butler swung out of its niche with a sheaf of papers. I startled at the noise, then reflexively stuck the book in my jumpsuit. The row butler delivered them to Pondicherry, who stuffed them in a briefcase. The embassy will be able to return you home by courier route in three hours. Unfortunately, I don't have the luxury of waiting around here until then. I have an important meeting to attend. You'll have to come along. Yes, sir, I said, trying to sound eager and helpful. Don't say anything. Don't touch anything. This is very sensitive. No, sir, I won't. Thank you, sir. The meeting was in a private room in a fancy restaurant, one that I'd been to before for an embassy Christmas party. Mama had drunk two glasses of sherry and had flushed right to the neck of her dress. We'd had roast beef and a goose wrapped inside a huge squash the size of a barrel, like they grew on the moon. Pondicherry whisked through the lobby and the main dining room and then up a narrow set of stairs without checking to see if I was following. I dawdled a little, remembering Pa laughing and raising his glass in toast after toast. I caught up with Pondicherry just as he was ordering, speaking brusquely into the table. Another man sat opposite him. Pondicherry looked up at me and said, Have you dined, boy? Uh, no, sir. He ordered me a plate of calf livers and cream sauce, which is about the worst thing you can feed a boy if you ask me. Which he didn't. Sit down, he said. Mr. Nussbaum, Master James Nicholson, I am temporarily in loco parentis until he can be sent home. Nussbaum smiled and extended his hand. He was wearing a gray suit with a strange cut and a black tie. His fingers dripped with heavy gold rings, and his hair, while short, still managed to look fancy and a little sissified. Good to meet you, son. You Lester's boy? Oh, yes, sir. He was my pa. Good man. A damned shame. What are you doing here? Playing hooky? I guess I just got lost. I'm going home soon as they can get me there. Is that so? Well, I'll be sad to see you go. You look like a smart kid. You like chocolate cake, I bet. Sometimes, I said. Like when? When my mama makes it with a glass of milk after school, I said. He laughed. A strangled har 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 sound. <laughs> you guys kill me. Your mama, huh? <laughs> well, they make some fine chocolate cake here. Though it may not be as good as the stuff from home. He thumbed the table. Sweetie. Sand up the biggest piece of chocolate cake you got down there and a glass of milk, will you? The table acknowledged his request with a soft green light. Well, thank you, sir, I said. That's quite enough, I think, Pondicherry said. I didn't come here to watch you rot young James's teeth. Can we get to business? Pondicherry started talking in rapid clipped sentences, punctuated by vicious bites of his food. I tried to follow what it was about. Trading buffalo steaks for rare metals? I got that much, but not much more. The calves' livers were worse than I imagined, and I hid as much of them as I could under the potatoes, then pushed the plate away and dug into the cake. I sneaked to look up and saw that Nussbaum was grinning slyly at me. He hadn't said much, just ate calmly and waited for Pondicherry to run out of steam. He caught my eye and slipped a wink at me. I looked over at Pondicherry 
who was noisily cutting a piece of steak, oblivious and winked back at Nussbaum. Pondicherry daubed at his mouth with his napkin. Excuse me, he said. I'll be right back. He stood and walked towards the WC. Nussbaum suddenly jingled. Distractedly, he patted his pockets until he located a tiny phone. He flipped it open and grunted, Nussbaum, into it. Jules, he said a moment later. How are things? He scowled as he listened to the answer. Now you and I know that there's a difference between smart and greedy. I think it's a bad idea. He listened some more and drummed his fingers on the table. Because it's not credible, damn it. Even the title is anachronistic. No one in 1902 is going to understand what neuromancer means. Think about it, would you? Why don't you do some of Twain's stuff? Those books have got legs. My jaw dropped. Nussbaum was talking to the Frenchman, and he was helping him to cheat, to steal from Mark Twain. I was suddenly conscious of War of the Worlds down the front of my jumpsuit. I thought back to Mr. Adelson's assignment, and it all made sudden sense. Vern was a plagiarist. Nussbaum hung up just as Pondicherry reseated himself. He took a sip of his drink, then held up a hand. Pondicherry eyed him coldly. Look, Nussbaum said. We've gone over this a few times, okay? I know where you stand, you know where I stand. We're not standing in the same place. Much as I enjoy your company, I don't really want to spend the whole day listening to you repeating yourself, all right? Really, I don't think... Pondicherry started, but Nussbaum held up his hand again. That's all right. I'm a rude son of a bitch, and I know it. Let's just take it as read that you and me spent the whole afternoon letting the other fella know how sincere our positions are. Then we can move on to cocktails and compromise and maybe have some of the day left over. Pondicherry started to talk again, but Nussbaum plowed over it. I'll go to six troy ounces per steer. You won't get a better offer. Ninety-eight percent pure ores. Better than anything you'd ever refine back home. It's as far as I go. Sir... Is that an ultimatum? Pondicherry asked, his eyes narrowing. Call it whatever you please, Buster. It's my final ironclad offer. You don't like it? I can talk to the Chinaman. He seemed pretty eager to get some good metal home to the Emperor. You wouldn't. He's too far back. It would violate the protocols. That's what you say. It may be what the trade court decides. I'll take my chances. Six and a half ounces, Pondicherry said in a spoiled brat voice. <laughs> you don't hear so good, do you? Six ounces is the offer on the table. Take it or leave it. Nussbaum pushed some papers across the table. Pondicherry stared at them for a long moment. I will sign them, sir, but it is with the expectation of continued trade opportunities. This is a good will gesture. Do you understand? Nussbaum snorted and reached for his papers. This is about stakes and medals. This isn't about the future. It's about today. Now. That's what's on the table. You can sign it, or you can walk away. Pondicherry blew air out his nose like a crazy horse and signed. If you'll excuse me, I need to use the WC again. He rose and left the room purple from the collar up. <laughs> what a maroon, Nussbaum said to the closed door. This has got to be a real blast for you, huh? I grinned. I it's not so bad. I liked watching you hogtie him. <laughs> he laughed. I never would have tried that on your father, kid. He was too sharp. But Fatso there, he's terrified the Chinaman will give the Middle Kingdom an edge when it faces down his royal navy. All it takes is the slightest hint, and he folds like a cheap suit. That made me <laughs> chuckle. A cheap suit? I gave him my best innocent look. Who else knows about the Frenchman? I asked him. Nussbaum grinned like he'd been caught with his hand in the cookie jar. I realized about halfway through that conversation that being Lester's boy, you've probably read just about every word old Jules wrote. I have, I said. I took out War of the Worlds. How does Mr. Wells feel about this? I asked. I imagine he's pretty mystified, Nussbaum said. Would you believe you're the first one who's caught on? I believed it. 
I knew enough to know that the agencies that policed the protocols had their hands full keeping track of art and gold smugglers. I'd never even thought of smuggling words. If the trade courts found out, well, hardly a week went by that someone didn't propose shutting down the ambassador ships. They'd talk about how the future kept on leaking passwords, and if we thought 1975 looked bad, imagine life in 1492 once the future reached it. The ambassadors had made a lot of friends in high places, though. They used their influence to keep things on an even keel. Nussbaum raised an eyebrow and studied me. I think your father may have figured it out, but he kept it to himself. He and Jules got along like a house on fire. I kept the innocent look on my face. Well then, I said, if Pa didn't say anything, you'd think that I wouldn't either, right? Nussbaum sighed and gave me a sheepish look. I'd like to think so, he said. I turned the book over in my hands, keeping my gaze locked with his. I was about to tell him that I'd keep it to myself, but at the last minute, some instinct told me to keep my mouth shut. Nussbaum shrugged as though to say, I give up. Hey, you're headed home today, right? He said carefully. Yes, sir. I've got a message that you could maybe relay for me, you think? I guess so. I said doubtfully. I'll make it worth your while. It's got to go to a friend of mine in Frisco. There's no hurry. Just make sure he gets it in the next ten years or so. Once you deliver it, he'll take care of you. You'll be set for life. Gosh, I said, deadpan. Are you game? I guess so, sure. My heart skipped. Set for life. The man you want to speak to is Redicop. He's the organist at the Castro Theater. Tell him Nussbaum says get out by October 29th, 1929. He'll know what it means. You got that? Redicop, Castro Theater, October 29th, 1929. Exact attackily. He slid War of the Worlds into his briefcase. You're doing me a hell of a favor, son. He shook my hand. Pondicherry came back in then and glared at me. The embassy contacted me. They can set you at home six months after you left. There's a courier gateway this afternoon. Six months? I said. My mama will go crazy. Can't you get me home any sooner? Pondicherry smirked. Don't complain to me, boy. You dug this hole yourself. The next scheduled courier going anywhere near your departure point is in five years. We'll send notice to your mother, then, to expect you home in mid-July. Tough break, kiddo, Nussbaum said, and he shook my hand and slipped me another wink. The courier gateway let me out in an alleyway in Salt Lake City. The embassy had given me ten Wells Fargo dollars and fitted me out with a pair of jeans and a work shirt that were both far too big for me, so that they slopped around me as I made my way to the train station and bought my ticket to New Jerusalem. It was Wednesday, the normal schedule for the Zephyr Speedball, so I didn't have too long to wait at the station. I bought copies of the Salt Lake City Shout and the San Francisco Chronicle from a passing newsie. The Chronicle was a week old, but it was filled with all sorts of fascinating big city gossip. I read it cover to cover on the long ride to New Jerusalem. Mama met me at the train station. I'd been expecting a switching right then and there, but instead she hugged me fiercely with tears in her eyes. I remembered that it had been over six months for her since I'd gone. James, you will be the death of me, I swear. Oh, she said after she'd squeezed every last bit of stuffing out of me. I'm sorry, Mama, I said. We had to tell everyone you'd gone away to school in France, a familiar male voice said. I looked up and saw Mr. John Stone standing a few yards away with our team and trap. He was glaring at me. I've had the barn gateway sealed permanently on both sides. I'm sorry, sir, I said, but inside, I wasn't. Even though I'd only been away for a few days, I'd had the adventure of a lifetime. Smoked and drank and been jacked and escaped and received a secret message. My mama seemed shorter to me, and frailer, and James H. Johnstone was a puffed-up nothing of a poltroon. 
We'll put it behind us, son, he said. But from now on, there will be order in our household. Do we understand each other? Our house? I looked up sharply at my mama. She smiled at me nervously. We married, James, a month ago. Congratulate me. I thought about it. My mama needed someone around to take care of her, and vice versa. After all, it wasn't right for her to be all alone. With a start, I realized that in my mind, I'd left my mama's house. I felt the Wells Fargo notes in my pocket. Congratulations, mama. Congratulations, Mr. Johnstone. Mama hugged me again. Mr. Johnstone drove us home in the trap. All through the rest of the day, Mama kept looking worriedly at me whenever she thought I wasn't looking. I pretended not to notice and did my chores, then took my chronicle out to the apple orchard behind the academy. I sat beneath a big, shady tree and reread the paper, all the curious bits and pieces of a city frozen in time. I was hardly surprised to see Mr. Adelson, nor did he seem surprised to see me. Back from France, James? Yes, sir. Looks like it did you some good. Though, I must say, we've missed you around the academy. It just wasn't the same. Have you been keeping up your writing? I'm sorry, sir, I haven't. There hasn't been time. I'm thinking about writing an adventure story, though. About pirates and space travelers and airships, I said. That sounds exciting. He sat down beside me, and we sat there in silence for a time, watching the flies buzz around. The air was sweet with apple blossoms, and the only sound was the wind in the trees. I'm going to miss this place, I said, unthinking. Me too, Mr. Addison said. Our eyes locked, and a slow smile spread over his face. Well, I know where I'm going, but where are you off to, son? You're going away, I said. Yes, sir. Is that a copy of the Chronicle? Give it here. I'll show you something. He flipped through the pages and pointed to an advertisement. The Slippery Trick is in port, and they're signing on crew for a run through the South Seas in September. I intend to go as quartermaster. You're leaving? I said, shocked to my boots. To my surprise, he pulled out a patch of tobacco and some rolling papers and rolled himself a cigarette. I'd never seen a school teacher smoking before. He took a thoughtful puff and blew the smoke out into the sky. To tell you the truth, James, I just don't think I'm cut out for this line of work. Not enough excitement in a town like this. I've never been happier than when I was at sea. And that's as good a reason to go back as any. I'll miss you, though, son. You were a delight to teach. But what will I do? I said. Why, I expect your mother will send you back east to go to school. I graduated you from the academy in absentia during the last week of classes. Your report card and diploma are waiting on my desk. Graduated? I said, shocked. I had another year to go at the academy. Don't look so surprised. There was no earthly reason for you to stay at the academy. I'd say you were ready for college myself. Maybe Harvard. He tousled my hair. I allowed myself a smile. I didn't think I was any smarter than the other kids. But I sure knew a whole lot more about the world. Uh, the worlds. And maybe, in my heart of hearts, I knew that I was a little smarter. I'll miss you, sir, I said. Call me Robert. School's out. Where are you off to, James? I gestured with my copy of the Chronicle. My hometown? Whatever for? I looked at my shoes. Oh, a secret. I see. Well, I won't pry. Does your mother know about this? I felt like kicking myself. If I said no, he'd have to tell her. If I said yes, I'd only have myself to blame if he spilled the news to her. I looked at him, and he blew a streamer of smoke into the sky. No, sir, I said. No, Robert. He looked at me. He winked. Better keep it to ourselves, then, he said. The ticket girl at the Castro Theater wasn't any older than I was. 
but she wore her hair shorter than some of the boys I'd known back home, and more makeup than even the painted ladies at the saloon. She looked at me like I was some kind of small-town fool. It was a look I was getting used to seeing. Redacop only plays for the evening shows, kid. No organ for the matinee. Who are you calling a kid, I said. I'd kept a civil tongue ever since debarking the train, but I was getting sick of being treated like a yokel. I'd been farther than any of these dusty slickers would ever go, and I was grown enough that I'd told my mama and Mr. Johnstone that I was going off on my own instead of just leaving a note like I'd originally planned. You, kid, you want to talk to Redicop, you come back after six. In the meantime, you can either buy a ticket to the matinee or get lost. On reflection, telling my mama was probably a mistake. That meant that I was locked in my room for two consecutive Wednesdays so that I couldn't catch the train. On the third Wednesday, I climbed out onto the roof and went down the rope ladder I'd hidden behind a chimney. The Wells Fargo notes I'd started with were almost gone, mostly spent on the expensive food on the train. I hadn't dared try to sneak any food away from home. My mama was no fool. I thought about buying a ticket to the matinee. I still had almost five dollars, but a quick look at the menus in the restaurants had taught me that if I thought the food on the train was expensive, I had another thing coming. I shouldered my rucksack and wandered away, taking care to avoid the filth from dogs and people that littered the sidewalks. I told myself that I wasn't homesick, just tired. October 29th, 1929, huh? Redicop was a small German with a gray and spade beard and a heavily oiled part in his long hair. His fingers were long and nimble, but nearly everything else about him was short and crude. He made me nervous. Yes, sir. Mr. Nussbaum thought you'd know what it meant. Redicop struck a match off the side of the organist's pit, lighted a pipe, then tossed the match carelessly into the theater seats. I winced, and he (laughs) chuckled. Not to worry, kids. The place won't burn down for a few years yet. I have it on the very best authority. Now, Nussbaum says October 29th, 1929. What else does he say? He said that you'd take care of me. He gripped the pipe in his yellow teeth and hissed a <laughs> laugh around the stem. He did, did he? Well, I suppose I should. Of course, I won't know for sure for more than 25 years. I don't suppose you want to wait that long. No, sir, I said. I didn't like this little man. He reminded me of some kind of musical rat. I thought not. Do you know what a trust is, James? We would cover that in common law. I could rattle off about 30 different kinds without blinking. I have a general idea, I said. Good, good. What I'm thinking is, the best thing is for me to set up a trust to a lawyer I know on Market Street. He'll make sure that you are always flush but never so filthy that someone will take a notice in you. How does that strike you? I thought it over. How do I know that the trust fund won't disappear in a few years? You're nobody's fool, huh? Well, how about this? You find your own advocate, a lawyer, a bondsman, someone you trust, and he can look over all the books and papers. Make sure it's all square, John. How does that strike you? Redicop knew I was a stranger in town, and maybe he was counting on my not being able to find anyone qualified to audit the trust. But I had an ace up my sleeve. I wasn't anybody's fool. That sounds fair, I said. Back at my mama's, I'd had long, hard days doing chores, chopping wood, stacking hay, weeding the garden, carrying water. I'd go to bed bone-tired, limp as a rag, and as exhausted as I thought I could be. Boy, was I wrong. By the time I found Mr. Adelson's room and house, I could barely stand. My mouth was dry as a salt flat, and it was hard to keep my eyes open. They've got hills in San Francisco that must have been some kind of joke God played. His landlady... A worn-out gray woman whose sour expression seemed directed at everything and anything let me in and pointed me up three rickety flights of stairs to Mr. Allison's room. I dragged my luggage up with me, bumping it on the stairs, and rapped on the door. Mr. Allison answered in the same shirt sleeves and suspenders I'd seen him in that Christmas. An age ago, 
when my mama dragged me to his cottage. James, he said. Mr. Adelson, I said. Sorry to drop in like this. He took my bag from me and ushered me into his room, pulling up a chair. What on earth are you doing here? He said. Do your parents know where you are? Are you all right? Have you eaten? Are you hungry? I'm pretty hungry. I haven't eaten since supper last night on the train. I tried to make it sound jaunty, but I'm afraid it came out pretty tired sounding. I'll fix the sandwiches, he said, and started fishing around his sea chest. I watched his shoulders move for a moment, and then my eyes closed. Well, good morning, Mr. Adelson said, as I sat bolt upright, disoriented in a strange bed with a strange blanket. Coffee? He was leaning over a little sterno stove, heating up a small tin pot. Morning sun streamed in through the grimy window. I wrapped up your sandwich from last night. It's there on the dresser. I stood up and saw that except for my shoes, I was still dressed. The sandwich was salt beef and cheese, and the sourdough was stale, and it was the best thing I'd ever eaten. Mr. Adelson handed me a tin cup full of strong coffee, and though I don't much like coffee, I found myself drinking it as fast as I could. Thank you, Mr. Adelson, I said. Robert, he said, and sat down on the room's only chair. I perched on the bed's end. Well, you seem to have had quite a day. Let's hear about it. I told him as much as I could, fudging around some of the details. My mama surely did know where I was, even if she wasn't very happy about it. And of course, I couldn't tell him that I'd met Nussbaum in 1975, so I just moved the locale to France and caged around what message he'd asked me to deliver to Redicop. It still made for a pretty exciting telling. So you want me to go to this lawyer's office with you? To look over the papers? James, I'm just a sailor. I'm not qualified. I'd prepared for this argument on the long slog to the rooming house. But I know something about this. They won't believe it, though, and will slip all kinds of dirty tricks in if they think that the only fellow who'll be looking at it is just a kid. Explain to me again why you don't want to wire Mr. Johnstone to come and look it over. It sounds like an awful lot of money for him not to be involved. He's not my pa, Robert. I don't even like him, and chances are he'll hide away all that money until I'm 18 or 21. And try and send me off to school. And what's wrong with that? You have other plans? Sure, I said, too loudly. I hadn't really worked that part out. I just knew that the next time I set foot in New Jerusalem, I'd be my own man, a man of the world, and not dependent on anyone. I'd take Mama and Mr. Johnstone out for a big supper, and stay in the fanciest room at the Stableman's Hotel, and hire Tommy Benson to carry my bags to my room. Besides, I'm not asking you to do this for free. I'll pay you a, an administrative fee. Five percent for life. He looked serious. James, if I do this, mind I said if, I won't take a red cent. There are things here that you're not telling me. Now, that's your business, but I want to make sure that if anyone ever scrutinizes the affair, that it's clear that I didn't receive any benefit from it. I smiled. I knew I had him. If he'd thought it that far through, he wasn't going to say no. Besides, I hadn't even played my trump card yet. That if he didn't help me, I'd be out on the streets on my own. And I could tell that he didn't like that idea. Mr. Adelson wore his teacher clothes for the affair, and I wore the good breeches and shirt I'd packed. We stopped at a barber's before. Mr. Adelson treated me to a haircut from the number two man while he took a shave and a trim. We boarded the cable car to market, like a couple of proper gentlemen. And if I thought flying in a jetpack was exciting, it was nothing compared to the terror of hanging on the running board of a cable car as it labored up and then quickly down a monster hill. The lawyer was a foreigner. Frenchy or a Belgian, and his offices were grubby and filled with stinking cigar smoke and the din of the trolleys. He asked no embarrassing questions of me. 
He just sized up Mr. Adelson, then put away the papers on his desk and presented a set from his briefcase, laying out the terms of the trust, and retreated from the office. I read over Mr. Adelson's shoulder, the terms scribbled in a hasty hand, but every word of it legal and binding, near as I could tell. The amounts in question were staggering. Two hundred dollars every month? Indexed for inflation for seventy years or the duration of my natural life, whichever was lesser. The records of the trust to be deposited with Wales Fargo, subject to scrutiny on demand. Mr. Adelson looked long and hard at me. James, I can't begin to imagine what sort of information you traded for this. But, son, you're rich as Croesus. Yes, sir, I said. Do these papers look legal to you? Yes, sir. They seem legal to me, too. A bubble of excitement filled my chest, and I had to restrain myself from bouncing on my heels. I'm going to sign it, I said. Will you witness it? I've got a better idea. Let's get that lawyer and take this down to the Wells Fargo and have the president of the bank witness it himself. And that's just what we did. Mr. Adelson had spent the previous night on the floor while I slept in his bed. My first month's payment was tucked carefully in my pocket, and over his protests, I pried loose a few bills and took my own room in the rooming house, and then the two of us ate out at a restaurant whose prices had seemed impossibly out of reach the day before. We had oysters and steaks, and I had a slab of apple pie for dessert with fresh ice cream and peach syrup, and when I was done, I felt like a new man. Mr. Adelson had a bottle of beer with dinner and a whiskey afterwards, and I insisted on paying. Well then, he said, sipping his whiskey, you're a very well set up young man. What will you do now? All throughout my scheming since the second return from 75, the prospect of what to do with all the money had niggled away at the back of my mind. All I knew for sure was that I didn't want to grow up in New Jerusalem. I wanted adventure, exotic places and people, danger and excitement. Over dinner, though, a plan had been forming in my head. Does the slippery trick need a cabin boy? He shook his head and smiled at me. I was afraid it was something like that. Son, you could pay for a stateroom on a proper liner with all the money you have. Why would you want to be in charge of chamber pots on a leaky old tub? Why do you want to sail off on a leaky old tub instead of teaching in Utah or working on the trolleys here? It took me most of the night to convince him, but there was no doubt in my mind that I would. And when the ship sailed, that I'd be on it with a big leather-bound log writing stories. This podcast and the story of Place So Born are licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 3.0 license. Some rights reserved. Author's Note From the day I read my first novel, Alice in Wonderland, I was hooked through the bag on narrative. I systematically read my way through my classroom libraries, through the books at home, and finally through the school library and the local branch library. Somewhere along the way, I stumbled on T.D. Fitzgerald's great brain memoirs, young adult books that told the story of Fitzgerald's childhood in Aidenville, Utah at the turn of the century. Fitzgerald's wonderful and improbable tales of the pluckiness and cunning of his brothers and playmates stayed with me. And when I decided to write a novella about time travel, it only seemed natural to revisit Fitzgerald's small-town Utah with its spirit of limitless possibility, of technological marvels hovering there on the brink, of a frontier freshly tamed and more frontiers opening ahead. So, a place so foreign. It seems to me that time travel would have a tendency to leak backwards, spinning out alternalities of ever-increasing anachronism and sophistication, 1975 and 1902 are two eras ripe for time travelers to pitch their tents, time places filled with boundless optimism for the future and a spirit of adventure. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story. Yeah, that was a little bit of an experiment for us. 
doing a, uh, he called it a novella, I guess. Uh, remind me, where does novelette end and novella begin? I thought it was 20,000 words. No, I don't think this one makes it to 20,000 words, so I could be wrong. You never know. No. This is something we talked about when we first started the podcast of doing more lengthy stories, doing multi-part episodes. I don't imagine we'll do this for a while, though. It took, was took too much out of you. It took us three different recording sessions to get through this, right? Uh-huh. Hours and hours sitting at the microphone. Sitting on these wonderfully comfortable kitchen chairs that we have in my wonderfully unfurnished study. Press the button, folks. But yeah, that is something that I always wanted to do. You know, when we started out, we said we are the fiction magazine. And I wanted it to be like a magazine where you had novelettes, as well as short stories, as well as novellas, serialized sometimes. Uh, and I, I still would like to do that more often than we have done. You're not completely overwhelmed after having to edit this story, though? You're not burnt out? It's not that bad. Huh. Okay. I think if we kept the episodes maybe a little shorter than what we did last week might help. But uh, I think it would be cool if we could get at least one in per quarter. But they don't all have to be 18,000 word novellas. I mean, they could be 10,000 word stories and that would make me happy. Well, that's where the listeners can help us out. Uh, again, if you'd like to help us produce stories, if you'd like to help us edit stories, if you'd like to help us do voices... Uh, it might take some of the burden off of poor Big's back. <laughs> Seriously, because like the last story, Kingdom of Flies, Kingdom of the Flies, the Kingdom, Kingdom of, of the Flies, Kingdom of Flies, that story about the flies, somebody else edited for us, right? Yeah, that's right. Brian uh, produced that story for us. And we put that story where we did so that you'd have an extra week to edit A Place So Foreign. Right? Yeah, so, that was uh, giving us the chance I figured since it was more or less two episodes worth of material, hopefully I'd be able to take care of the two weeks. And if that worked out, then you're listening to us right now. We're here. Hey! No, we talked uh, off the air, or we talked to Abby, or we talked to a homeless guy on the street, because who was he going to tell, about doing another two-part episode in the future of a longer story. And so, yeah, it's, if you're up for it, I'm up for it. As a matter of fact, I've got my eye on a story already that I think we may do. Oh, okay. Well, there's that. And is there any point in telling how you acquired this particular story? Well, a cool thing about Cory Doctorow's stories is he releases everything on the Creative Commons license, kind of like we release our show on. He's kind of open to anyone doing his stories, so I just dropped him an email and said, Hey, we'd like to do one of your stories. Is there one that hasn't been podcast yet? And he said, well, if you can find one, you're welcome to it. So I went and looked through some of his stories that he had, and I couldn't find anywhere that this story had been podcast before. Maybe I'm wrong, and somebody's going to say, hey, you guys suck. This one was already done. But uh, as far as I know, yeah, this is a, the first audio rendering of this story. Basically, his idea is, as a science fiction author, it's much easier to fall into obscurity and be known by no one than to have your story plagiarized and stolen from you. He has much more of a problem of making sure that people know who he is. So he makes sure that everyone can get a hold of his stories via Creative Commons and they can uh, check them out that way. It makes it much less likely for him to fall into obscurity like many other books that are copyrighted and they're locked down and they go out of print and are never heard of again. That's really cool that, that Corey did that. Uh, what, what is his website? Just his website is craphound.com. Can you find his stories on that website? You can. He's got them all in there. You can uh, download a text file of them and, and read through them. And he has a podcast, if you're into that kind of thing, where he reads his stories as well. And, and if you do check out that podcast, be sure to uh, brave your way through the first story because his audio quality does improve a lot. That's cool. And, and chances are there's nobody that is coming here listening to this that is a Doonstief fan that's going to get turned on to Cory Doctorow. It's probably the opposite, that there are Cory Doctorow fans that are listening to us for the first time. But if it's the opposite, go check that stuff out. Um, the first time I heard of Cory Doctorow was the story crap hound that they did on Escape Pod. And I was telling my friend about it, and he's like, oh, yeah, this is one of my favorite writers. Here, let me lend you this book. And the book was A Place So Foreign. Ah. 
And uh, you were hooked through the bag from there on. (laughs) You know, he said that in his author's note. Is that what I think it is? I'm pretty sure it is. Ouch. Thank you, Corey, for uh, your whole Creative Commons ideal and for allowing us to do his story. You know, we've talked about that in the past. We don't have a lot of money to pay our authors. And a lot of the times when they're recognized writers like Corey, it's just charity letting us do their stories. That's right. And so thank you for the charity. Yeah, I'm, I'm not above accepting charity, but for two things, really, uh, short stories from talented writers and, and sex, you know, from anybody, really. Warning, today's episode contained comments from Rich Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. Okay. Oh, I'm That was a sort of awkward moment. Maybe we should move on. I'm sorry. Um, uh, what did you think of it? I love this story. Mm -hmm. I just absolutely adore time travel stories. I've written a few myself, all of them bad. (laughs) That's funny because personally I think that it's hard to do wrong with a time travel story, really. It's it's just one of those great things that you can use in science fiction that's just so fun. Whether it be a serious story or just a completely goofy story or whatever. You know, one of my favorite time travel movies of all time is... Not Back to the Future, although I do, dare you? I do love that one a lot. It is Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It was fun. And one of my favorite parts is at the end when they're like, oh, how do we rescue all our friends from the jail? And they're like, oh, after this, we'll go back in time and we'll leave the keys to the jail right here. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's why the dad can't find his keys. Jeez, about six months ago, or it might even have been a year you proposed to me, and, and I said I had to think about it. No, you proposed maybe doing a whole month of time travel stories. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. do was this going to be part of it? This was not going to be part of it. That's still planned for uh, further on down oh, the so line, Oh, so we could perhaps. still do that? We may still do it, yes. Cool. There's absolutely nothing I like more than uh, just a really, really slutty girl. No. This is why you don't have a Parsec Award, Rish. Dude, stop it. No, there's absolutely nothing I like more than something goes wrong and time travel comes into it and you have the opportunity to go back and fix that thing that went wrong. Uh, I used to uh, tell people that the ending to the Dolph Lundgren Masters of the Universe (laughs) was the best ending of a movie ever. Did you really say that? And people would look at me very much like you're looking at me now. Face for radio, folks. But I sort of meant it. I love the ending of Back to the Future. You know, just the, the everything that we had so wonderfully set up in the first few scenes has been fixed and changed and made better. And oh, granted, they probably just ripped off Back to the Future there with the end of Masters of the Universe. But oh, gosh, I just loved that feeling of all that was wrong is now right. Okay, <laughs> now, okay I, I'm the first person in history to ever have liked that Masters of the Universe. All movie. I remember from the end of that movie is when they were all leaving and they say, don't say goodbye, say good journey. Okay, well, on second thought, that wasn't a very good movie. Um, <laughs> on second I never thought, liked it. come on. But yeah, and Audrey Neffenegger wrote the book The Time Traveler's Wife, um, which I think is just a great book. It was so enjoyable. The first time I heard it, I just happened upon it in audio at my library, which I live in a very small town, and the library is very... It's two Maytag refrigerator boxes taped together. Yeah, it's pretty small. It's very reflective of the size of my town. So there's not a lot of choices. But strangely, the audiobook of The Time Traveler's Wife was available one day when I was there. And so I grabbed it and I listened to it. And it was enjoyable from start to finish. That's one of the really fun time travel books that is out there. I was really excited to find out, too, that they were going to make that into a movie, which I just finally saw. The book had a really nice languid pace to it. Never felt like it was rushed. Um, Unfortunately, in the movie, I guess because movies are only two hours long, you know, it seemed like there was that breakneck pace that they had to do to get all the good stuff into the script and, and put that all up on the screen. They went really quick from one thing to the next to the next. And it was just kind of a little bit of a bummer. But I still enjoyed the film. It's hard not to enjoy a film with Rachel McAdams in it. I mean, she was tremendously hot. Now, are you saying that just because you know how much I don't like Rachel McAdams? Do you really not like her? Why? What do you mean, why? Why? I just don't like her. Why do you not like her? 
You saw how she was in that movie. I wanted to punch her through the whole flick. It was nice. She had known what the world was. she was getting into from the time she was six years old. And then suddenly she's all offended. Wait a second. You've known way longer than he has what's coming. And yet now you bite his head off? Sorry. Uh, she was still hot. I don't like Rachel McAdams. Although they cut her hair off and then it kind of went away. You realize we can use none of this. Yeah. The book was better. I hope we can both agree on that. Well, that's generally the case, though. You don't get a book that's bad made into a film very often, so you can almost always say that the book was better. Uh, about this particular story, one thing that really struck me the first time I read it was uh, I didn't realize what was going on when uh, Jules Verne had written Tarzan. Uh huh. And uh, honestly, boy, I apologize, Corey. I thought he had made a mistake. <laughs> And then the next time Vern had written a book that he hadn't written, I thought, well, this has to be intentional. Uh -huh. Of course, it pays off. But, you know, the same way we were saying with time travel stuff, setting up things that, that don't seem significant at the time. And it's one thing that you can especially do in a, a work this length. If you get into the realm of 18,000 words, you can set up all sorts of things and pay them off way down the line. It never really came through to me until later. I think I may have even talked to you about it when I was finally done reading the story. And I said, you know, he goes to be the ambassador of 1975. What is the deal with 1975? He lives in a null G donut with transparent walls. Did he mean 2075? Or I just didn't get that for a long time until we talked about it, I think. And we decided that. The future was bleeding into the past as these ambassadors kept bringing stuff back and changing things, and it steadily was working its way back. 1975 was now the future. But yet 1902 was still pretty much uh, the same that we know it as. Yeah, also, if there were any anachronisms in 1902 that were mistakes, we would never know it because we would assume, oh, it's because the timeline has been contaminated. Yeah, it's always nice when a story ends at the beginning of a journey or with more yet to come. Even if you have no intention of writing a sequel or following it up, just leaving it open to imagine what might happen next has always been really cool. It gives the reader a chance to make something up themselves, which is what I used to do all the time when I was a kid, man. That was my favorite thing was to make up the next Star Wars sequel or whatever. I would go around and act it out. Well, see, that's something I don't think I ever knew about you. You were a writer, a would-be writer even then, and you were also an actor or would-be actor back then? <laughs> I don't know if you could call what I did acting, but I suppose pretty much everybody does that to a degree. But uh, I'm starting to notice it already happening with my kids as well. My daughter, for example, this week, she took a bunch of pieces of paper, stapled them together at the end so they'd be like a book, and started writing a story in there. The story was all about her stuffed animal, this poor child that had this stuffed animal, but his mom made him give it away. And what was he going to do without a stuffed animal? That's cool. I, I think it's important to encourage kids to do stuff that doesn't involve the TV or the video games. <laughs> You know, anything creative or anything that's more active rather than passive. Yeah, I was considering I, I was, the growing obesity of kids. Oh, I, w I hadn't thought of that. But I, I meant mentally involving rather than just vegging out right. kind of thing. And I babysat my niece last week and she had gotten one of those Goosebump books. And she was reading it and she was really into it and telling me what was happening. And, and I said, hey, let's go to the bookstore and buy another one. Because I was impressed. Like my little brother just hated to read. And <laughs> I know that my youngest sister felt like that. That was always a chore. That was an assigned thing to do. A lot of people feel that way. Uh -huh. And to see her excited about a book and wanting to share it with other people was cool. Because I felt that way before. I mean, we wouldn't be here if we weren't interested right. in reading short stories. And so I took her to the store. Boy, we probably bought like six Goosebumps books. But, you know, it's worth it. It's cool. That it she, is. Because that Sunday, she spent uh, the whole day just on the couch reading these books. And I felt bad that the books went so fast for how expensive they were. But <laughs> yeah, she wasn't tempted to get on the goddamn World of Warcraft for Kids thing that I've talked about on the, on the air before. And uh, she wasn't turning on the TV. So there was that. 
folks like us, we've kind of always read or were turned on to reading earlier on than a lot of people are. Where it's, oh, I got to read this book for my class, and they hate it. But, uh, for example, when Harry Potter came out and it became this phenomenon to where everybody had to experience it, children were reading these huge books. It's almost like it saved literacy in, <laughs> in a small way. It showed a lot of people that thought books were boring and stupid and for nerds or something like that. It made all these people give them a chance. When the Harry Potter phenomenon hit, my aunt is this religious nut. I probably mentioned her on the show. She, oh, she was so infuriated. All these kids were reading about witchcraft and, you know, the devil had written a book personally and now everybody <laughs> had it and stuff. And I was just like, can you just be happy that kids are reading a book? It, no matter what the subject matter is or whatever, you know, I mean, it was just so glasses half empty from her that that actually affected me when these god awful Twilight books started hitting as a sensation, a phenomenon. I thought, well, okay, they may be terrible. I may not appreciate them. But again, people are reading and I guess I, I shouldn't be upset about that. If somebody didn't like to read and then new moon came out and they read that and enjoyed it they were bound to read more books in the future i i would hope we talk about it all the time i wish i read more and yet i read more than 99 percent of the people i guess in the world yeah that's definitely true an interesting thing that came out of harry potter i think is that the young adult type category has just kind of exploded within the last 10 years to where you know you used to be able to know the really popular young adult authors even though you weren't a young adult anymore you got your Beverly Cleary and your Judy Bloom, and they were reading the same books in school that you read when you were in school, but things have changed so much recently that they've just gone through the stratosphere, and you've got the Percy Jacksons all the way to your Twilight, which is a young adult novel of sorts, although it seems like mostly uh, 30-year-old women that are actually reading those books. The same people that are buying the Justin Bieber album. <laughs> <laughs> young adult books. I mean, I've read a lot of them recently, and I hadn't considered reading any before that. Uh, this one was a lot of fun for me to read, at least. I haven't listened to it yet, but uh, I know it took me a while to get into the voice of the character of the main guy. And so there may be some shift at some point when the voice changes. I don't know if you've noticed that. Everything works that way, that it always takes a little while to get into the rhythm or get into the groove boy you've got to prove your love to me are you guys singing again sorry <clears throat> <laughs> but uh, yeah it was it was fun to read i guess that's what i was going to say and i hope that it was fun to listen to yeah i hope so both of the long stories that we've done so far cast the demon shadow back in december which is twelve thousand words long and then this one which is eighteen thousand words were both read with that western accent the entire way through by the narrator so if you've got a long story set in some sort of a Western theme, send it to submissions at dunesteve.com. <laughs> and you've got apparently a much higher chance of getting accepted. Can you remind the listener what the process is for that? Oh, with the long story, you just need to do a, a query on the story. You basically say, here's a synopsis of what happens, and then here's the first two or 3,000 words, something like that. The first few scenes of it, see if it sounds like something we'd be interested in. And then if we are, we'll have you send the rest of it to us, and we'll read the whole thing. This is just a reminder that the Broken Mirror Story event is in full swing. What does that mean exactly, full swing? Uh, is that like when a baseball player is like halfway through, that's full swing? It's the opposite of a bunt. Oh, what a silly bunt. Okay, so this year's premise is a child is proclaimed king. Or queen. But it turns out to be more than just a game. This year, you have the whole month of May to write a story based on that premise. It can be any kind of story, any length of story. Send it to us at submissions at dunesteef.com and put Broken Mirror Story Event, Broken Mirror Submission, BMSE, one of those things in the subject line. That's right. Slush readers will read through those. They will rate them, and the ones that receive the highest marks will be made into an episode of the show. Probably sometime around September or so. Sounds good. Hey, what's going on in the world, Big? 
Oh, you know what? If you swing over to Podcastle, you've heard of that one, right? Yeah, I believe they're in the Escape Artists uh, continuum. Oh, yes. what, what, what would the word be for that? Milieu, I think, is the word you're looking Whoa. for. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, French people, I, I take that back. At Podcastle, we've got a story up that we, uh, well, that you took all the glory on and read. But it's up and available. So uh, if you want a little bit extra Dune Steve in your week, swing over to Podcastle and check out the story that we did over there. What story was it that you read, Rish? I think it was called Mario's Three Lives by Matt Bell. Wow. It's almost like Announcer Man just channeled into your head there for a second. That was pretty impressive. Well, I called up the file and put it in front of me so that I would be able to refer to it. Oh. You're mocking me, aren't you? And Big, where would you find that story? I think you would find it at podcastle.org. You can find it at its .org domain. It's, it's a fun little story. And you can swing over there and check it out. Enjoy yourself for five or ten minutes. I think that's all it takes to listen to that story. We have to do it. Guess what, Rish? The Oscar for Best Animated Feature in 2001 should have gone to Monsters Incorporated. Yeah, but I was thinking of something else. Oh, was it uh, that Cheryl Ladd was a much better angel than Farrah Fawcett, but now that Farrah's dead, we can't get away with saying that? Uh, no, no. It's time to ask our listeners for donations. Well, I don't want to. When have you ever wanted to? Look, I'm sure there's an episode somewhere where I was all cheerful about it. I'm pretty sure there isn't. Have you listened to all of our shows? Uh, yeah. Well, I highly doubt that. There are like 16 of them. Uh, it's a little closer to 70. Come on. No, check it out sometime. Well, if there really are 70 episodes, then I'm sure there's one where I was happy about asking for donations. Yeah, by your logic, there's probably an episode where R080T compliments you, and one where you score with that girl from that 70s show. Well, math was never my strong suit, but if you say so Wait, the red-haired girl or the one with the annoying voice? I don't know. Which one do you like better? Hmm. Actually, I, you know, I quite admired the red-haired one for a long time. Well, at least when I watched the show. But the little one is, she's really grown into a handsome young woman. The little one with the annoying voice? Come to think of it, they both sort of had annoying voices. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, but... You know, I'm sensing a conspiracy here. Please ask for donations, Rish. Okay, I will. But only because you said please. And inferred that I might score with the girl from that 70s show. Actually, I, I wasn't saying that you... What? Never mind. Okay. Folks, we would really appreciate it if you could donate to the show. We pay our authors. We need to cover various expenditures to get the show on the air. And we do that with your donations. If you just click on the PayPal link that's right there on dunesteef.com, you could donate any amount that you want. Or you could subscribe to donate every month, every quarter, every, every time the, the calendar changes. You know, it would help us stay on the air, and uh, it would help me get to sleep at night, frankly. <laughs> uh, you know, in my huge empty bed. How was that? Meh. I'll take that as a... Wait, what What does meh mean exactly? I don't know. It's just another one of those phrases stolen from The Simpsons. Excellent. So that brings us to the end of our episode, our two-part episode. That's right. Thanks for making it all the way through to the end of both, if you did. Yeah, if you didn't, then you don't hear me talking right now. That's that's fine. If you don't like us, then go that way. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you nearsighted scrap pile. Star Wars again? Yeah, I, f <laughs> I forget about that. That's, that's all right. You don't have to like me. <clears throat> all right. So it looks like we've made it to the end of our show and Rish is again in tears. Thanks for listening, folks. And signing off, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm <clears throat> I'm Rish Outfield. No McFly ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. Yeah, well, history's gonna change. See you later, everybody. No, oh, this is much better. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience.
Take two. From the day I read my first novel, Alice in Wonderland, I was hooked through the bag on narrative. Hooked through the bag. It's all right. <clears throat> Some hero I was. Some douche you are. You are. You are. You are. It was hard work. <laughs> you just switched over to a Boston accent because you said you are. <laughs> You're retarded. <laughs> you are. But what there was was pretty frightening. Frightening. Them cats was fast as lightning. Mostly they were betting shops or bars or low rent bounce of I'm going to say it the other way in case you like that better. I don't. Are you sure I didn't say bounce of before? Didn't he use this word before? I don't know. I think it's actually bounce eaterias. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Except when I was looking around for a public phone. I'm just going to say pubic phone one time just to see if you leave it in. I'm thinking about writing an adventure story, though, about pirates and space travelers and airships, I said. I'm thinking of inventing steampunk, or at the very least cyberpunk. Your report card and diploma are waiting on my desk. Graduated? Listen to that Miley Cyrus voice. That was pretty good. Oh, a secret. I see. Well, I won't pry. Does your mother know about this? No, she's too busy boinking that evil man runs the county store. They've got hills in San Francisco that must have been some kind of joke God played. His landlady, uh, Mr. Adelson's not God's, a worn-out gray woman whose sour expression seemed directed at everything and anything. No. Douche. Do you know there's a county in Utah called Duchesne? Named after you. I stood up and saw that except for my shoes, I was still dressed. Thank God. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I told him as much as I could, fudging around some of the details. I've heard you like to fudge around. Sorry. I can't begin to imagine what sort of information you traded for this. But son, you're rich as somebody that I don't know Croesus. how to pronounce. Croesus? Uh -huh. But son, you're rich as Croesus. You're a very well set up young man. What will you do now? I'm going to dick all throughout my scheming. All throughout my scheming since the second return from 75, the prospect of what to do with all the money had niggled away at the back of my mind. Yeah, I said it. It seemed to me, it seems to me, that time travel would have a tendency to leak backwards. Spinning out alternities. Alternalities. Alternalities, yeah. Spinning out alternalities of ever-increasing anachronism and sophistication. Damn. Spinning out alternalities of ever-increasing anachronism and sophistication. <laughs> That's hard, dude. <laughs> Spinning out alternalities of ever-increasing and credit. Spinning out alternalities of every... How, what is the word? If it's short stories or sex, I'm not above accepting charity. Just let's let that be known. You're not asking Corey for sex, are you? Oh, is that what it sounded like? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm sure he's a very handsome man, but I, I'm also sure he lives very far away. So anyhow... Personally, I think that it's hard to do wrong with a time travel story, really. you got to suck really bad to do a time travel story that I won't like. Oh, except for you people who submitted us time travel stories that we decided we didn't want. But yeah, and, uh, another one of my favorite books. I guess I haven't talked about a book yet, but one of my favorite <laughs> books is uh, Audrey Neffenegger, and I'm not sure if that's how you say her name, but... You can't say that. That's our word. It's Time travel is so great. It's really hard to screw up a time travel story, uh, except for Rich's stories, of course, because I've read those. And <laughs> Anyways. Thank you, sir.